can join us. And also, as we journey through um, in terms of this, Emmanuel and the team, um, if you can take the front row. Let me also invite. Um, Emmanuel is going to be um, the lead. You will be the moderator for the session. Um, I think most of us have time to read his profile. He's going to share that a little bit with us later on. Let me also invite for you to come up front. Um, those who had time to look at our profile also, um, we call them the gurus in ICT. Um, yeah, they know ICT in and out. Um, let me also invite Andrew to come to the front. And one of the interesting things that we have done is also to bring in practitioners on the ground. Who work with young people? I'm going to talk of the young people the truth. one is the one, the two. Then we have Sosten come through to the front also. We are really happy to have, to have uh, the panel here. We have two more that will join us later on um, after the break. Just to add on to Some of you think we had to do the lessons together, and uh, I enjoyed the lessons yesterday. Well, um, as mentioned, some of you have read my bio. Uh, my background is economics uh, with a bias towards development. Yes, I have worked in the government for seven years. I was a provincial economist or senior economist for the Minister of Commerce, Trade, and Industry. And, um, well, I left, I joined the private sector where I actually consult for uh, businesses. And uh, currently, that is what I do for businesses and NGOs on matters of economics and development, as well as I drive uh, policy around development in different sectors. Um, it could be ICT, could be education because everything feeds into the growth of the economy. So I'm glad that um, I'm with you today with the rest of the panel. Uh, they look very um, eager to speak with laptops. And well, I'm also excited that I'll be actually feeding from them. Well, I think uh, without Going into detail, I will just um, ask each and every one of, their, of our panelists today to just uh, sh share with us who they are, what they do. Please, there's a mic there. Hi. Um, you can all hear me, yeah? Okay. Uh, Mr. Moderator, am I supposed to stand? What are you comfortable uh, well, with? Well, I, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, are you able to see her? <laughs> sure. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Bonich Bembere. I'm so excited to be here. I'm here on behalf of Computers for Zambian Schools. Um, as the name implies, um, we specialize in making sure that schools have access, is, access to computers. So we're a Zambian uh, Nash, um, NGO, or a charity, is known in some circles. We've been around since 2005. Our vision as a Zambian NGO is to ensure that every Zambian child has access to technology. So we've been working at this for a very long time. Initially, our main focus was ensuring that the schools were supplied with low cost, but good quality refurbished computers, which we um, work in conjunction with our partners in the UK, IT Schools Africa. So essentially we supply computers, but then through our interaction with the teachers, we did some M&D, we found out that yes, we were supplying the schools with computers, um, but their usage was not uh, very good in terms of, uh, we used to supply computer labs, for example, um, but we would find that if the ICE teachers aren't there, the computer lab is closed. So then we were listening to the teachers who then told us that they wanted to be trained in ICT, 
and it's not just the ICT teacher, but um, the geography teacher, the maths teacher. So we then um, focused, uh, we, we then went into what we, were we are now calling teacher training. So in this teacher training, we then started doing a basic ICT literacy uh, teacher training course for our teachers. Um, and it's been a success, um, especially during COVID, because every teacher, regardless of just the ICT teacher, whether it's geography or the languages, started, they needed to use technology. So that's, that's what we come into. We're also very passionate about educational content, e-learning. Um, this is just to help the teachers with their teaching and learning materials. So that's basically what we do as Computers for Zambian Schools. Um, myself, as the program manager, um, I come from a retail background. I've worked in several countries, uh, UK, other countries in Africa, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, South Africa. So I'm very excited to bring those skills into the Zambian uh, scenario. Um, I just wanted to say that you know, I'm, I, I'm, I get very excited when I come into a room and I see so much youth, so much potential. Um, I'm a disruptor in terms of, uh, I love for us to have that back and forth in, con in conversation. So if I speak too fast, for example, put up your hand and tell me. I'll tell you. <laughs> Don't be <Okay>. afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to spending this time with you and just also learning from you because I'm sure you come from amazing backgrounds. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sure, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Sure. I'm Andrew Dumisani Moyo. And I also work for a Zambian NGO, just like Boni, yeah, Computers for Zambian Schools. Yeah, so she did talk about the vision that our organization has. Well, I'll talk about the mission. The mission is to transform ICT education in Zambia. That is the mission that our organization has. And uh, I do come in as an IT professional. I've got a background in IT. I've been working in the field for, I would say, over 10 years now. And as such, I've gained quite a lot of skills to contribute positively to our organization and hopefully to the session that we're going to have today. In addition to that, our organization also conducts uh, trainings in ICT, as you heard from Boni. So we have been conducting these trainings from way back from 2019. And have trained quite a lot of teachers in basic ICT to just ensure that they are using this knowledge to better themselves in the profession of teaching so that they can be as effective as possible. Just recently we were hit by COVID-19 and it was difficult to interact physically with the students as such uh, ICT was noticed to be actually a key factor if they were to continue with uh, disseminating this information to our dear students and learners in Zambia. So, uh, computer literate and are able to use computers as they deliver the lessons. As uh, an M&D consultant, and I think they have shared very generous details about the organization, and I think that makes my work very easy. Um, generally, my background is in development, like Mr. Emano. I think at some point we were schoolmates. Oh. <laughs> yes, so my background is also in development, but um, uh, with, uh, I, I took an interest in monitoring and evaluation, and that is what I am doing with Computers for Zambian Schools. We believe that what doesn't get monitored is to check on how uh, our, our implementation is going. Is there progress towards our desired um, outcomes? And that is where I come in for Computers for Zambian Schools, to check if, if, if what we're doing at the schools with the teachers in terms of training and the equipment that we've distributed is being used for the intended purpose and the teachers are benefiting from the training, interacting with uh, all of you during this session. Hope I'm not blocking anyone. Good morning, everyone. A man that needs no introduction. Mushanga Sosten are my names. Basically, I'm a teacher by profession employed by the Republic of Zambia, of which I'm proud of. I teach ICT, though you call it ICT, but us, we call it computer studies, because the terminology ICT is too complex for our learners, especially the grade ones, the grade twos. So it's just computer studies, meaning it's the basics. I have been in service for quite a long time, 
if I'm corrected, I'm supposed to be clocking eight years, meaning I'm eligible for, for NAPSA. <laughs> uh, I won't say much because we still have got a long day to go, but otherwise I say it's an honor to be amongst the intellectuals that are with me, especially Madame Boni, and I've always seen her mostly on paper, but today I have uh, a one-to-one -one session with her. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmanuel. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, maybe we can clap for our discussants. Thank you. Well, uh, great profiles, big names, great experience. I'm sure we are all expected. Well, um, I think I'll start with Mr. Moyo because I think that is where it all begins. He's an IT uh, practitioner. I think uh, he will be in the best, best place to actually help us uh, with what we want to actually achieve in the first part of our session. But just to take you through, it's uh, important to know the objectives of this session. One, we need to define what ICT is. It's very cardinal to know what you're talking about can't have solutions for something you do not know. Yes. So we'll go on, explain the importance of ICT at primary and secondary school level. Identified, really highlighted the same way it is highlighted with me here. I had to break it down and demystify it just for our better understanding. Yeah. Then from the impact, definitely, uh, like it was said, you need to come out with solutions. We are leaders. So we need to come at solutions. Well, the discussion is going to be very interesting, and I just ask you for one thing. Take down, uh, if you have questions, just write it down. I think we'll have a question and answer session uh, where you're going to ask those questions as the presenters will be uh, getting down with us. Well, we go to the big question. What is ICT? In our context, I know uh, it was mentioned by Mr. Sosten that it's such a complex uh, topic or maybe subject, but we're going to break it down. I think we need maybe expert definition on ICT. Uh, Mr. Moyo, I think you'll help us with that. Okay. So ICT, Information Communications Technology. I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear that term but mainly it has to do with using technology in order for us to communicate, to gather information, electronic gadgets, computers, and others to ensure that information flows to as many people as possible. So in short, it's just a model that is being used to ensure that uh, information is wowed over and reaches as many people as possible. Well, that's great. Um, I think Mr. I'll ask Mr. People think television is not it, whether it's an apple. Those are tools we use for ICT. This is why I said ICT, it's the company avoid certain terminology. Bonnie. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just thinking of digital literacy at this stage. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think what my uh, uh, colleagues have said I think covers it, and I, I know my audience is quite knowledgeable in that. Um, we're, we're looking as CFCS more even at digital tools, digital literacy, to expand it from your smartphone to your smartwatch to your to your, to, to your, uh, to the, your <laughs> Then I have a question: Why is it that uh, we are still aligned to thinking ICT is about computer? Don't you think we are still behind? Uh, thank you very much, moderator. Yeah, you know, when the team came on board, especially to be very specific in Zambia, ICT, people think uh, it's something that to do with big things, like things that you see in movies. But uh, being complex, or being uh, the way the moderator has asked it, for you and Draft discover that our city uh, referring ICT to just basically computer like in, in schools and a computer in line of 
there are other gadgets that uh, are in use that uh, people don't consider as computers. For example, he mentioned of a phone, yeah, a projector as we are seeing it right here. If you tell someone this is a computer, well, they'll think, what is he talking about? But it is a computer and it is being used to disseminate information and as an ICT tool. So the concept was way broader. To speak, offering the subject, and even now, I think uh, in our public schools, and that's why the concept, so I think as we progress, we're making strides, or, you know, we're taking those steps, uh, advancing, we'll get to that level where people's understanding of ICT is broadened. Great, Bonnie, you'd like to add something? Yeah, I just, um, I really love Elena's comment on that. I think the idea is for us to have a stepping stone. Um, I love how the, amongst the major players out there in ICT, so the idea is for us to have a stepping stone. It's true that we, compared to our friends, maybe we are not as far, but I, summits like this will mean that we hold ourselves accountable to making those strides. Great. Uh, well, those are great responses, not so. Well, I just went through a study that was done in 2019 by University of Zambia student, um, just assessing the level of ICT uptake in schools. And uh, according to the research paper, actually it was indicated that there was poor uptake of ICT in schools, basic, uh, primarily primary schools and secondary schools. Mostly the affected schools were in the peri-urban areas. And um, some of the identified challenges were, you know, lack of equipment, lack of infrastructure, and the knowledge level of teachers, skills, and the likes. Yes, but uh, before I get to that, I was very much interested in that. Uh, I'll get to that d detail later. Uh, why should we be talking about ICTs in primary and secondary schools today? Why is it important? I'll start with, uh, from my left, Mr. Sosten. Thank you very much for us adults. Subjects, HE, Expressive Arts, and Technology Studies. In within technology studies, you discover that it's not only about technology studies. There's also design and technology. I hope you are following. Then there's also computing. Now, when you look at the topics under computer studies, they're just basic copying and pasting, editing, how to calculate. So you'd wonder to say, how are we preparing them for the challenges ahead? Because by then, you're supposed to be doing this at early childhood. Because those are simple basics so that we prepare. Now, the biggest uh, worry comes in that the majority of the teachers that are teaching technology studies, they only learned about computer studies as a component in most of their schools, not until late 2015. So you'll find that in rural areas where you will go, the majority left college before that time, before the syllabus was being introduced. So it now hampers on the development. How do we progress? Because the moment you see a computer, just looking at it, it is intimidating. When somebody comes to you and tells you that they are 104 keys, then you'd wonder, do they look to be 104? Already you are challenged. So it is hard, it is difficult, but it is important that we need to start somewhere and we need to start with the children. If we start at primary, then we will be assured that in the next four, five years, we have better ICT teachers. By the way, if you look at uh, our Zambian setup, the best hackers that we have, the people that hack our Facebook pages are young ones. You agree with me. So if we start with them, we control them then we have the best technology, uh, technologians in the future. Thank you very much. Great, great response. Uh, Elena? Well, it, I think it's common knowledge that important or pivotal role that ICT plays in our daily lives cannot be overemphasized, really. Today, if, if uh, my youngest child is one year and seven months, and I can tell you that he knows how to locate his videos on my phone, yeah. So we have to move in the direction that the world is moving. And that's why I think my colleague is saying we must start as early as possible 
to train this generation that is coming up, you know, so that they can be uh, properly positioned to operate in this kind of society. So ICT is really, really uh, pivotal in our daily lives. If you can't operate a computer, I don't think you can work anywhere, really. Yeah. So why is ICT important at a primary level? Well, we are talking about young children. When a human is still young, they are still sharp, they are able to learn a lot more and to retain that information. So when it is introduced at a primary level, it really goes a long way. Once these children learn how to use ICTs in a better way, they perform better at school. They are able to do research in a better way, such that even when they advance to a secondary level, they will be well to do students. And like somebody is in secondary level, they don't know how to do research online. Yeah, that really draws them back. So it's quite important that they learn ICT from a primary level. That way it better prepares them to be better students as they advance on. Bonnie? I'm, I'm going to throw this one back to you, Emmanuel. Um, so I'm hearing my colleagues talk about the importance of uh, this starting at um, primary and secondary uh, level. And I'm even seeing your, your board up there talking about integration. Is that our next question, or this is the importance stroke integration? Yes. OK. Yeah, so the way my mind works, I, I immediately think you know, the idea is to integrate, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, perfect examples of uh, you know, a child you know, at, at starting from a, from a primary level. I think what we're hoping to see is a point where we even stop referring to it just as computers. We start saying digital tools. You know, uh, and how far those digital tools go, may hopefully we can contribute um, as well when we are more conversant. But that's my little take on it. So yes, the importance is there, but I feel that when we start throwing in integration uh, in schools at those levels, how far do you want to integrate? What does integration look to, uh, I mean, what does it mean to us as a country, as individual schools? You know, so yeah, if that makes sense to us. I hope it does. Uh I hope it does. Well, I think uh, to me, if you ask me what is the importance of uh, ICTs in school, I'd also ask a question: Where do you want to go? For me, is my small. Uh, maybe I can just pick on that. Um, you look at the yeah, sure. True, and I'm also thinking in line of what you are just saying. Uh, for example, Africa, where most African countries are developing countries. And uh, one of the factors where we are really lacking behind is technology. Yeah. Without it, it's uh, almost impossible for us to do well. Right now here in Zambia, and I'm sure it's the same in other African countries, computers are very expensive. Why is that? It's because we don't manufacture right here. Yeah. We usually buy where they're already manufacturing that uh, we should look forward to say, okay, when we reach that level, then things will be better. Yes, anything? Yes, I totally agree with what um, everyone else uh, has said. I think the, the critical issue here is development. And we know that what has drawn us back as African countries uh, in terms of development is value addition to what we produce. So to, to make uh, conflicts out of the maze, for example, why is that? Because of mechanization that is happening in industries, and that is as a result of uh, ICTs or t know the language. If only computers were made in Africa using the localized language, because you never see a computer that speaks a low, a, an African language, because mostly say that it's English. If you go to China, they use Chinese. That's why Chinese children have a familiar language. In Zambia right now, if I ask you, if you ask our forefathers, what's the correct term of computers? In, in our local language, you discover none because it doesn't exist. How do you expect a child to learn something that does not exist in their familiar language? Then you want them to learn it in, their, in a foreign language. This is why you discover that uh, computers, mostly children who do better, are those in private schools. Because the language they start with is English. In our Zambian curriculum, you start with our local languages. It's either Chinyanja, Silozi, Bemba, 
Now, when it comes to learning something that does not exist in your local language, it becomes a challenge. So if only we were to produce our own, using our own computers, like the way the Malawians do. If you call Malawian call center, they will tell you in their local languages, Dinizan one, Pitania Papaso. So even a local one will know what it means. Our is because of the what? The language. So only if we can develop, use uh, locally, develop them locally, using the localized government. What can help us move forward? Well, I'll move on. Um, very interesting. What has been achieved so far in ICT in education? Uh, I would like to maybe I'll start. Yeah, I'll start from the teacher himself. I think uh, it will be good to to know what he's experiencing on the ground. We are talking. We can talk the whole day. We don't get tired because that's what we are trained to do. What has been achieved so far? Uh, to be very specific, on uh, the first thing that has been achieved, computer studies has become examinable. It has no longer, for example, from grade 8 to 9, 10, 11, 12, it is examinable, meaning one has to write an exam. That's one achievement. Apart from that, even teachers who are doing primary education, diploma, computer studies is no longer a component, but a study area. So meaning they have, it also becomes examinable, which is a plus. The government of the Republic of Zambia has ensured to it that our curriculum caters the needs of the locals, so which helps us to under at least that the curriculum speaks much of focusing to it that uh, it's supposed to be localized, ensuring that you do something that is within. Apart from that, there is a lot. Government of the Republic of Zambia recently did the simple, you know, it's called simple, but it was a milestone. At least each and every school received not less than five computers. Now you can imagine the whole nation. I can go on and on because I don't speak for the government, but I've seen what the government has done. You know, when the computers were being introduced in 2014, 2015, I think the first exams in grade 9 and 8 was in 2015. We had challenges in 2015. Some of us that are Zambians will recall that in So now, for you to conduct power, now, here is a school has to be on the computer for not less than one hour, 30 minutes. Now you calculate the time you're going to spend. Now when you're doing practicals, no one is allowed to go home until you are done. So at one school, it was recorded that learners spent a night just to do their practicals and with the challenges of electricity. The government of the Republic of Zambia decided to bring in what we call SBA, school-based assessment, to avoid the pressure that occurs during the practicals. This school-based assessment, you start doing it early. It becomes a subject, it becomes part of your learning, not as practical, so that learners do not feel that pressure. Those of us that are Zambians, when it comes to practicals, we never used to do practicals at any time. We'd only do them during exams. This is why most of us didn't do very well in school, because we would only see them during the practice. So, but otherwise, they, they brought what we call SBA, where we can start it as early as in grade 8, start preparing them for the final exams, which is next year. So by the time they'll be there, they would have created marks. So instead of uh, giving them 100%, they have demolished it into two categories, paper 1 and paper 2. Paper one, which is con uh, contract, uh, composes of theory, which is uh, 70 marks, then 30 marks is practical. So they have to end them before they go to grade nine. So by the time they'll be in grade nine, they have at least out of 30, they have gotten 25. So this is why you discovered we are doing fine. On behalf of government, they are doing fine. So far, so good. Well, uh, that's a teacher there, uh, actually, is very happy with what the government is doing so far. So far, so good, as, as mentioned. Well, I'm very curious uh, to learn that uh, 
the government distributed computers to all the schools in Zambia. Well, very interesting. Um, um, uh, well, revelation there. I, I didn't know that because we've seen uh, some schools that are actually learning under a tree. So I'm wondering if, uh, yes, that is fact. And um, I'm wondering whether that those are part of the schools that are receiving the computers. Well, maybe that's something we can probe. Uh, but thank you very much, Mr. Sosten. Uh, I know uh, this is a discussion, don't worry, and uh, we, we're getting to brainstorm and uh, check each other and see what we can put forward moving forward. Well, uh, maybe, Bonnie, from the computer side, uh, what has been achieved so far? Um, I just wanted to focus on um, the stakeholder involvement um, I always like to ask people what their definition of a stakeholder is. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a stakeholder. Um, and not just talking on, top on, on behalf of computers for Zambian schools, but a stakeholder can be even the businesses, uh, it can be the community. So for me, the achievement has been how the stakeholders are taking this very seriously. We've seen, I mean, as a teacher, I'm sure you'll attest to the fact that if the parents are not behind the, the pupils, there's nothing that's going to move. And the, the parents are the majority uh, with, their, with their children, right? So um, that has been very impressive. We've had, uh, I mean, being computers for Zambian schools, we've had parents that come through that want help. They write us emails, they write us Facebook messages. That never used to happen. And it seems very small and minute, but it speaks to the fact that um, there must be a lot of awareness to how critical computers are if parents, um, even sending us text messages that's a very big thing someone someone coming in from uh, from a, a background of not texting originally um, speaking up to speaking towards uh, businesses uh, we've had uh, a lot of interest from telecom operators I know Airtel I know they were MTN they were doing some initiatives trying to support schools whether it's them for example um, helping a school with uh, some internet capability for a few months um, I think everyone is just trying to get on board in trying to make sure that these achievements um, are, are real and they are increasing. So that for me is a big thing because that wasn't the industry 15 years ago. Great. Uh, Demisani, I think uh, maybe you can speak from the perspective of an ICT practitioner. Probably have we developed anything that is making uh, learning friendly, uh, especially in... Oh, yeah. Uh, so... There have been a few achievements. I'll, I'll give an example. One of the institutions we have here, which is UNSA, they have been developing quite a few things. They've invented quite a few things in the ICT field. Uh, back then, there was nothing of that sort. The other achievement, for example, we've got robots, I'm sure you noticed, in our roads. The students are the ones who are actually fixing them most of the time. That is uh, an achievement as well, because back then you'd have to engage others, sometimes even outside the country, to come and do that. But well, at least we are making an improvement on that one, which is something we can be happy with. The other achievement is in line with what Mr. Sosten said. Uh, true, we don't still have as many computers as we would have or like to have in schools, but there is an achievement. Back then, you talk about a computer, the teacher himself doesn't even know how to operate it. But there they are, teaching the subject. Yeah, that I think is a thing of the past at this level. And uh, many thanks go to the government, of course, to many NGOs. They've been really doing their best to donate computers and see how to practically help. So see a computer as opposed to just hearing about it. And that goes a long way, even in society. They're even able to do small businesses, open up internet cafes, and so forth. That uh, builds positively to the economy, to the environment, and society, as opposed to just having people drinking beer or smoking, because having to my computer booths and support of the teachers. It's up to them to decide what they feel they need help with. Uh, I think my colleague can agree or disagree. Of course, uh, has helped to sharpen the skills. Uh, there is this newfound zeal among the teachers to want to do some of the work themselves. 
for example, in some of the schools that we worked with last year, we found that most teachers were able to type their own test questions, for example. It's usually something that is left to the school secretary or the guidance and counseling section. But because of the trainings that we implemented, teachers are better equipped to handle their own assessment, for example. They can assess learners. Uh, they can record, um, print, uh, they can type and print their own questions. So I think those are small, small print their own questions. So I think those are small, small steps for us speak to the fact that when you equip them, not just ICT teachers, but all teachers with basic computer... Reading some literature, we still have challenges, especially with um, community schools. Uh, they're still struggling. Well, but now we've defined ICT as gadgets that um, uh, help us with uh, information, uh, collection, storage, and dissemination. Uh, we now have cell phones. I think I can receive an assignment via cell phone. In short, what they would achieve was using a computer itself, like a laptop, a desktop. They would do the test papers. It, it was even being disseminated all the way to the students. I mean, we know that not all students have smartphones, but that's something that, that was not done before. That was being done in Malawi. I believe that's also being done in Zambia. I, I'm not too sure about the other country, countries, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, but I'm sure if we're doing it, you're doing it as well. So that's, 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 a, that's a phenomenal achievement for us to be able to use these little gadgets to complete assignments, for example. Elena, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what the two have mentioned. Actually, uh, through the monitoring that we did, we were able to find that, especially during the COVID uh, period where uh, teachers were encouraged to look for alternative uh, modes of learning and teaching, uh, WhatsApp became very pivotal. Yes, the teachers were able to share class notes, they were able to share assignments using uh, WhatsApp. It's true, the learners themselves do not have these gadgets. Usually if you are grade eight, grade nine, your, your mother will not buy you a, smart, a, mas a smartphone. But uh, through the parents, the learners were still able to access. So learning was not completely crippled during COVID because teachers were conversant with how to use these applications. And there's a, there's a component in our module for training where we focus just on WhatsApp, Zoom, emails, these things that are, you know, we take for granted. But like he said, our order of questions actually from what they're explaining. Uh, I hope, and I, I, I don't know, how do you, do you, are you using WhatsApp? Has it helped you using a gadget in place of a laptop or, or a computer? Thank you very much. It all depends on where the institution is located. Location matters. Most of the government schools, especially where we come from, are rural areas. And the people that we deal with are the locals, popularly known as the villagers, who literally, or some, own a phone, but not an Android. They own that one that contains buttons. So it's hard to communicate via WhatsApp, but at least via SMSs. You know, mode of communications are different. Then uh, you discover to it that uh, as you communicate, it comes with different notions, comes with different reactions, because you are not aware. For example, if you communicate to a mother's phone, or so they can't relate what is it that he's talking about. It's just that you're requesting them to come and collect their child's report form. Because they didn't read, so it becomes a problem, but we are trying by all means. Slowly, we are getting there. We have not to get tired. In as much as like the area question said, uh, the area question you asked, Emmanuel, to say, how have you achieved it as teachers? You know, being a teacher in a rural area, you are regarded to be somebody who is educated. Whether you, have the, whether you, know, it, whether you know it or you don't know it, they know that you know it. So be prepared to ask questions. So as teachers, we no longer write uh, questions on the board. It is a prerequisite, it is a must that you need to type questions and give each learner a hard copy so that they write on their own, which is an achievement. Though it had resistant, but due to uh, government's force, you like it or not, you have to do it. Above all, you discover that in the olden days, for one to be chosen as an IC teacher, you discover that if Promise is able to handle 
an android, then it's better off to do technology. Accidentally, Martha switches on a project. Ah, she's the right person. But it's just that she saw it somewhere. So now, with time going and the partnership that we are having with our stakeholders, the NGOs, those that have been identified to have the willingness to learn have been trained and they have come back to replicate the same knowledge. So you discover that with time, everyone is able to do it on their own. Thank you very much. Well, uh, great responses. I deliberately have that picture in front of you. And uh, I hope my panelists can see that picture. And uh, it's a bit, it's not very good quality though, but, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to demonstrate something there. Uh, that teacher doesn't seem to be an ICT teacher. Yes, I think those are body parts, right? Yes. So ICT, to me, is a means to an end. It shouldn't be an end in itself, but a means to an end. I think that's the more reason I emphasized on the need to have teachers incorporated, even if they are not ICT teachers. Because uh, if you were here yesterday, I heard um, the guest of honor, the PS, I think he did mention that um, he's not happy every time he walks in a class and finds a teacher with chalk all over, you know. I think that is why we need ICT to make life easier, to make uh, the process of learning very easy, and even for the teachers themselves. So it, regardless of what subject you teach, you need to embrace ICT as a teacher. I know we have teachers here and we have ICT practitioners here. So deliberately, I'd put that picture there. That is biology, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, wow, well, for grade 10, now that, that's when you learn the body parts, the stomach and everything. So maybe, uh, Bonnie, you have something to say? I can see. I literally want to agree with you, Emmanuel. We're very passionate about that. Um, this day during dinner, we had a few discussions with some of you by the tables, and the idea was for us to look at um, a computer or a digital tool like a pen. You use pen, a pen for maths, for drawing, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, like you've rightly pointed out, it shouldn't just be the ICT teacher capable of using uh, these digital tools. Even the languages teacher, like I said earlier, the, the French teacher, the English, whatever it is, should be able to use it. So that, that's, that's our objective. I mean, we, we are aiming to get there. Great. Well, that's positive. That's leadership, right? Yeah, being positive, I think uh, having a vision, I think um, that is what we learned yesterday. I think we're all leaders here. Well, we'll move on to something very critical. I think um, it, it forms, I think, the cornerstone of our discussion today. Well, the challenges of ICT today in schools. Yes, there are pictures there. I think that's a real picture of Africa. And, uh, when you talk of ICT in rural areas, basically, probably you find one computer there, and, uh, the teacher. It's even lucky that I think the teacher is even able to beam, you know on the board, but uh, in most circumstances, you find the teacher is surrounded by the pupils, and they're all trying to see what is on the small piece of screen, you know. But that is a real picture, and probably the other side, you get to see what they call a computer room. You can only have a certain number of pupils at a particular time because of the limited number of uh, computers and probably even the teachers themselves. But it's good that we've learned today that ICT does not just border on computers. You can use other gadgets. I have a very uh, interesting picture about um, probably how I envision ICT going forward, um, but I'll get to that later. I want us to just um, get to understand the real challenges around ICT in schools. What is leading us to where we are now? Why are we not where we're supposed to be? So what are the challenges? I'll start with uh, Bonnie. Um, just using your, 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 uh, your picture there, uh, Mr. Moderator, I, already um, when we interact with our schools, we know that uh, the space issues in terms of the size of the computer labs, uh, this speaks to even just the, the pupil 
to computer ratio, for example. You know, um, there's, there's an amazing NGO in Zambia called Asikana Network, and they passionate about coding. And one of their founders even said to us that whoever holds the mouse is the king of the laptop at that point. So if there's seven of us, but only one of us can hold the mouse, you know, what am I learning besides observing what the other person is doing? So yeah, um, I mean, I won't cover all the points, but at this point, I would just maybe highlight the fact that there's inadequate hardware and just uh, the space issues in terms of the classroom sizes. That is actually a very real challenge that uh, I have had an opportunity to see face on myself. I, I do conduct trainings in most rural areas. Some of them, the situation I find, you can really feel sad. You find it is a computer lamp, but uh, there is sometimes two, three computers. On those two, three, only one is working and it's very slow. So you'd find this teacher has got more than 100 students in ICT. They all come in the same classroom. <laughs> now, how is he going to practically teach the students? Yeah, it's really a huge challenge. So you'd find that uh, maybe from those 100, less than uh, 10 or 5 are actually benefiting. Because there's a challenge of, yes, he's got, let's say, 40 minutes to teach this subject with one computer or two, having a ratio of 100 students to that number of computers. So you'd find there is no enough time, actually, for all students to just come and practice what they are learning. ICT is a practical field or subject. As such, people don't learn well when they just hear someone saying something. They have to practice what they are being taught. And for as long as this challenge, as we are seeing in the picture, exists, well, it's really difficult to move forward. So true, it is really a big problem. Uh, I'd like to hear from uh, Sosten. I think uh, as a teacher, well, the real challenges that you're actually being faced. Thank you very much. Maybe you can highlight them. I think, I'll, I think they've really talked about the, the computers not being enough. Uh, well, it would also be good to hear other challenges Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, to start with, the biggest challenge that I've seen is that uh, when computers were being introduced, there were no trained teachers in school. The few that were trained, especially in primary schools, migrated to secondary schools for, uh, for better classroom space for better. Most of the head teachers or the managers we have are those people that are BBC. We normally refer them as BBCs, born before computers. So when you explain the difference between the hardware and the software, a projector, at least everyone can see. In most cases, you have computers that are computers by number, Ban has to be you. Definitely they are there. I'll speak from a different angle, not the computers themselves not being there, but it has to do with software as a bit mostly you software as a bit mostly you'd find you visit a school, you want to train the teachers, you find they are using but they are running on the most up to date softwares. And that's the same challenge that I've also observed when it comes to the security of the information. You'd find that most computers are corrupted. They lose information, uh, the files are corrupted, and because of to put their files on these computers. When they do, because the softwares are completely out of date, sometimes the students themselves have access to the same files. So that the damage really is a lot in that line. Because you can imagine somebody has set an exam, a student has access to that. So it really
this was uh, communication companies as they are setting up towers in rural areas probably um, that they pay less and everything for the towers there maybe that's one area you can look at if it as you engage with and uh, also engage ria on in these areas um, you wanted to say something bonnie i can say yeah thanks Emmanuel. That, uh, we definitely will take that on board um, and just uh, something that I also want to mention um, is uh, the challenge of e-waste um, and we don't talk about it enough um, there's uh, definitely a lack of awareness um, even as stakeholders um, so what we're finding that um, you know when schools have uh, they'll boast about having a 50 computer lab but only possibly 20 are working so what's the responsible way to dispose of those uh, computers that are not working? Uh, are, the st are the schools knowledgeable about the process to follow? Are they easily accessible, the costs? Um, so there's, there's all of that. We know that Zikta is also very passionate about this because it's part of their infrastructure plan as well. Um, so these are the challenges that we, I mean, we are advocating for more computers, but if they cannot be salvaged any further, how do we dispose of them responsibly without affecting our environment and our health? Uh, great. Uh, you want to say something, Dimisani? Uh, or maybe I ask you a question? Okay. <laughs> maybe I can say something on a different angle to do with challenges. It has to do with lack of maintenance plans for computers in schools. So you'd find that, yes, some, how should we do that? So that really isn't uh, there in most schools, especially the ones that are visited. So I do take it upon us how they can come up with a proper maintenance plan to help them ensure that the few computers that they might have, they keep running at top speed and in a manner that uh, they are usable. Otherwise, you'd find there are many computers, but a lot of them don't work. So is there a plan on how often you update the software and everything? Yeah, we usually do develop a maintenance plan. It's simply a document that you come up with. You say, okay, in a month, how often should we check the computers if they are working right or if there's something we can do to ensure that uh, they don't break down? Because it's more expensive to repair a computer that has broken down as opposed to just uh, doing some maintenance on it when it's still working. So the key factor there is to just have uh, things outlined on paper to say, after a certain period, we check how the computers are doing. Are they okay? Sometimes just even dusting them up goes a long way. Because when dust accumulates, well then a real problem sooner than later will come up. So you'd find that uh, it's quite essential to develop that plan of maintenance. Well, um I'll get back to my audience here. How many in your countries um, okay, have free education, like primary and secondary school? Just, just put up your hand if in your country you have uh, free education. Uh, well, I'm looking at, I'm trying to find someone. Uh, not from Zambia, of course. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find someone. Well, I know, I think most of you guys are from Zambia that have put up your hands. <laughs> yes, yes, in a purple shirt there. For this. Uh, he's a teacher, and uh, he interacts with the pupils. Zambia has free education, and I want to know how this has changed the whole landscape of... Meaning they introduced grant it because it has got it's already budgeted for it because it has got it's already budgeted for. So you need to follow according to what government requires you to do. So the biggest chunk or the biggest part of the money goes to teaching and learning materials. It's 45 learners. But right now, especially in schools that are in town, you discover that they are 95 learners. If I'm, if I'm wrong, then it means the child cannot be enrolled. Why? Because it is full. A teacher has got only a meter between the teacher and the board. You see how hectic it is now. Yeah. The number of books to mark. There are some of those classes, if you put them the powers, they are taller than your height. Now imagine you have got six classes to manage. So it is, it is really a challenge, 
but government is trying all its level based to address that one. There's something that you mentioned, Emmanuel, that I was very keen to mention, uh, to explain, especially when it comes to internet connectivity. Right now, the Examination Council of Zambia uh, has introduced what we call OCRS, Online Candidate Registration. For you to write an exam, whether at grade 7, grade 9, grade 12, internal, GCE, you need to register internally. Uh, you need to register via the internet. Here is a teacher in rural area where internet is there, but it is very slow. So now, you need to enter 53 learners. How many hours are you going to spend? Remember, during the day, Zambia network becomes congested. Hence, a teacher has to sleep early so that he wakes up in the middle of the night so that his work is done in a faster way. So it becomes a challenge. Infrastructure. When you talk of infrastructure, I want to draw this picture to you. Not the schools that you have been, where you have 21 classrooms. In rural areas, if you have got five classrooms, five more classrooms, you are better off. Because in some schools, five is the highest number. Just there, Mr. Sosten, I'll cut you short. There's a picture you've just caught my attention. Very Thank interesting very picture. That's a rural area. That's a school. You are running one to seven. One to seven. They are running from outside. These are pictures that we should draw in our heads than those that we see in towns. You have to have, uh, apart from that, the number of teachers they have, it's four. There's a head, a deputy, and two teachers. A head has gone for a meeting, the deputy has gone for a meeting, the other has gone, you are remaining alone to manage the whole school. So it becomes a challenge. But otherwise, there's always a way. You have to do it. We cannot complain. We always manage them. A teacher is always a teacher. There's nothing that does better apart from being a teacher. So now, you look at it. He's trying his level best to teach in that kind of classroom. Then automatically, they are not connected to the national grid. There is no power. There is no gen set. So for you now to start teaching computers, it is already a challenge. The environment itself tells you that this is more like a no-go area. Henceforth, you try by all means to do one or two things as not as expected. Apart from that, Mr. Emmanuel, the number of periods allocated for computer studies is six periods. When you multiply six by 40 minutes, against the number of pupils you have, it's unattainable. Not forgetting that the same teacher, I can go on and on because I'm one of those that face such challenges. Thank you very much. Well, I'm glad. Uh, Elena, you want to add something? Yeah, just in addition to the many challenges he has highlighted, I think uh, from the learner perspective, one of the biggest issues is the fact that uh, the time -tickle aspect. And so, you know, computers, technology, these are hands-on kind of things. You need to, to learn by practice. And so because learners don't have these facilities, no adequate space for, for the computer lab, they don't have enough computers, it becomes very difficult for them to sharpen their computer skills because they are taught theory most of the times. Like, like in that case, you know, if the teacher has to do his best, then he will cover the theory aspect, but then the, pr the practical aspect will suffer. And also a related challenge is that even in schools where you have uh, a computer lab, most of these are kept under lock and key for safety reasons. Of course, equipment is very expensive to buy. So that controlled access to the computer lab also limits the amount of time that the learner can use to sharpen their acquired computer skills. Even teachers, some teachers will not access the lab. In some schools, only the ICT teacher can actually enter the computer lab. And so that means it's very difficult even for the teacher to accomplish some of the tasks that they would wish to do uh, using digital tools. So that is uh, some of the challenges that are related to what he has said. Well, um, so, uh, Mr. Oh, you want to say something? Yes, uh, just in addition to her point of the computer lab uh, being under lock and 
being locked and so forth. It's very true. I remember just recently I was in Copper Belt, uh, one of the secondary schools there. The whole computer lab, like they store all the computers. Yeah. So after replacing just a few, you can now imagine the security that they've put. <laughs> yeah, it's really something else. Even a teacher himself who is not a teacher for ICT, just going near that lab raises a lot of questions and issues. So I found quite a very tense situation. Now if it's like that with teachers, how students themselves have to interact with the computers in that computer lab? So it's really becoming a huge challenge. Well, um, those are the challenges that have been highlighted. Um, I think uh, there could be some questions that are still burning within yourselves. You can write them down. We'll come to a question and answer session. I think we'll allow you to actually uh, bring forward those questions. Um, but the conversation goes on. Um, I'm looking at this picture. I deliberately put it there uh, of a teacher trying to teach. I think this is still happening in Zambia um, in the rural areas. So I, I guess you do not, you have challenges in reaching out to certain parts of the country. I, I, I do not want to believe that uh, every school has received the computers and uh, that picture still exists somewhere. Yeah, um, so I do not know how you are able to deliver the computers to, you know, the in some parts that are you know, outside the line of rail in the rural parts. Do you have any means of delivering the computers or maybe you just have access to those that are within the line? Um, Africans are very resilient. We're very creative as well in our problem solving. Um, so as computers for Zambia schools, what we do try uh, when we do find situations like this, um, Huta Lab and what's been happening is that they are then allowing neighboring schools to come through and access their computer lab. Uh, it's better than nothing. I mean, ideally, because of that challenge is that they are then having to open up their computer labs to neighboring schools. So yeah, it, it is true. Um, that's, that's a challenge that we're facing right now, but um, other schools are doing that for the time being. Mr. Sosten, just uh, from your experience uh, regarding that question. Well, uh, truly, Challenges always remain challenges. But the question should be, at what extent? How have we able to address some of these challenges? Are we making progress or we are still on the same pace? Otherwise, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, we normally do what we call, you write, you request, you write through our stakeholders, requesting, now for them to be approved, they are taking too long. And remember, this is it. Whether you taught, you didn't, uh, you, you taught or you did not teach what you taught. So whether they learned or didn't, because like uh, my colleagues have said it earlier on to say, you normally much have to focus on the theory part. Because if you look at the way the marks are sectioned, 30% is practical, 70% is theory. So if I cover much on theory, then the learner, at least they can get to 40 plus because the minimum is 40. Then at least they will pass. To avoid me as a subject teacher or as a computer teacher being questioned or being letted as somebody who never taught. Because at the end of the day, what we call analysis, subject by subject analysis. So they will not look at why you failed. They look at why the learners did not get a particular mark. Because they'll say that our target is to make sure that learners get 70%. So now, they, they got 40% knowing that there are too many. That is not considered. You are considered to be a failure, but not knowing that the challenges are there. So most teachers would rather focus on the, 30 uh, on the uh, theory part to avoid the analysis or detaining their names or avoid being charged. So this is why it becomes a challenge when it comes to hands-on. A child did very well in the computer, on paper, but when it comes to practical, it really can do nothing. You can attest to me, you can testify, Mr. Emmanuel, that even in our homes, the dependence that we have, when you receive an SMS from GoTV, GSTV, they can't read. They'll wait for you and know there's something here. 
Can you open us for us? It's just something very simple. So this is why it is really a challenge. So if, uh, like, government put it in its theory, like uh, the SDA, which is uh, Sustainable Development uh, Go or SDGs, number four, to have a sustainable and a long learning process that at least by 2030, each and every learner should be computer literate, being able to use a mouse or being able to do computers. Right now, those of us who have got parents who are very old, if you check their Airtel pin, MTN pin, you agree to me that it's the year they were born. If you are born in 1965, that's their pin. Why? They don't want to forget. They can't change. If you change, they are in trouble. So the best you do is they have to maintain. That's why it is, the, it is easier for children to figure it out. Just know your mother's year they were born. Well, so f what is going through my mind is a question. Is it that when we talk about ICT in schools and uh, uh, the secondary schools and primary schools? The situation at the school level, it comprises of uh, the teachers who are head teachers, deputy teachers, as well as the PTA. Now, when government pronounces to say it's free education in rural areas, when you tell a Zambian that it's free, even when you have got suggestions to build something, let's work together, it becomes a challenge. Well, uh, just there, when you tell a Zambian that it's free, well, it's, 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 it's most parts of Africa. <laughs> yes, it's free, it's free. It means we, even when we say, let's create our own project, uh, begin to call the higher office, labeled, some school in here, you know. So I, I, I get to think, they just think it's theory then at the end of the day, you know. Like, because I, I, I think myself, if I'm seated and someone is in front of me, we need to learn ICT for communication and all that. And uh, the mentality that we school managers themselves, they are not youths. In most cases, these are older people and as such for them, they still have that mentality to say ICT is not that essential. And as such, they don't see that great need of even reporting it further, asking for more help and so forth and so on. So it just has to do with the mentality. Our minds should change. We should start seeing things as the rest of the world are seeing them. Once we have that mentality that ICT is really important, then it would be easier for these changes to be made. Otherwise, for as long as our mindsets are still tuned to say, this is not an important field, then such changes will not be achieved. Uh, the leaders are yet to appreciate ICT. You know, the mindset is still backwards. So we haven't really appreciated ICT. I think that is the biggest so as, as computers are something schools, um, young leaders, um, so it, it's an exchange. It's a not a top-down communication, although it might feel like that for the time being. But <laughs> I know when we go through to the solutions, uh, we look forward to your input. Uh, it, it's never about finger pointing. Uh, like I'd mentioned earlier, as, as Africans, we are we're very resilient and creative. So let's use that to our advantage, really. Elena? I think, um, uh, personally, since, since you're talking about uh, administration at that, since you're talking about uh, administration at that level. Uh, personally, I think... It is around ICTs. Okay, so I hope you've dotted down your questions. They are very... Uh, ask Mr. Sostin to just um, maybe just uh, break down, you know, the, the identified challenge. I, I know the discussion has been here and there, maybe so that our uh, listeners or the audience can really just write down the challenges that we've identified. All right. Uh, some of the challenges that have been identified and mentioned, infrastructure being a challenge, connectivity to the power grid, uh, internet, internet uh, connectivity, computers themselves, lack of uh, genuine softwares, like Mr. Moya said, uh, stated earlier on, we all have outdated softwares. Apart from that, time limitation. Teachers trained in ICT are not as many as we expect as compared 
to the number of computers that we have or the number of schools that we have. So there are a lot of challenges that have been mentioned. And not forgetting that I'm glad to say that the panel that you see in front of us, at least each one of us has a laptop, which is a good thing. And the challenge is that none of the at least most of the, not at least, but most of the participants do not have a computer with them there. If at all, each one of them had or was given one, it would have been a better thing because you're talking about technology. It has to start from here. So otherwise, the challenges are ongoing, and there are many. Even the administrators, like my colleagues have said, the local administrators, most of them are above 35. For you to be a head teacher, the minimum is 35. But for you to be there, because there are a lot waiting in line, so you have to be at least 45 or 55, waiting for five years to retire. So it is a challenge. By then, you find that most of them are not familiar with computers. Thank you very right. much. Uh, we are preparing leaders. I think that's the whole essence of this. So if there are teachers here, well, uh, I think you're close to 35. Very soon you'll be there. And uh, you'll become head teachers. you influence direction and everything. Well, uh, our colleagues have actually uh, put up something, um, the challenges of ICT. In, so you can take down the notes, those that are taking down the notes. If you can come forward and maybe... Okay, since we've already discussed them, I'll try to just sum them up for you. So I'll be going through the slides in a little bit faster way, since we've already talked about almost all these points. So as you can see there, maybe let me get a chair so that I don't obstruct you. It's good to have a partner, right? <laughs> So we did talk about inadequate hardware, if you remember. This is the part where we mainly talked about uh, schools not having enough computers, not only computers, uh, equipments to use, or as uh, teaching ICT and other subjects as well, things like projectors and so forth. So we did outline that this is like one of the major challenges that we have in ICT in education. The other thing we talked about is inadequate uh, computer laboratory space. We did outline the fact that, uh, yes, in as much as we have what we might call as computer labs, most of them are, are not in a good state. They are not in a good state, and as such, they really hinder the learning process of our dear students. And they also make it challenging for teachers themselves to teach in the right way. We also did talk about uh, things to do with uh, lack of internet or slow connectivity. Most of the schools are in the rural areas where there is completely no network. Yeah, so it poses a huge challenge because if ICT is to move forward, it is that they are connected to the, to the World Wide Web. But as it is now, Lack of internet is a huge challenge. And as such, we hope that in the afternoon, we are going to brainstorm to see how really we can uh, find a solution to this problem. The other problem we looked at was the broken down computers. Yes, some schools have got quite a couple of computers, but most of those computers are not in a good state, are not working, and the few that are working are very slow, cannot even connect to the internet. So this also is a huge challenge because, yes, you can be counting to say, well, such a school has got this many computers, but from all those, you'd find that very few of them are actually in a working state. The other problem that we looked at was uh, to do with the, the complicated technical jargon that is there in ICT. This is the terminology that is being used when uh, teachers are teaching this subject. Well, most of those terms are not in the vernacular languages that we have. And as such, it's posing a challenge because these uh, students, for them to fully benefit from these lessons, they have to do it in their local language. Yeah, learning in a foreign language is quite difficult because sometimes, well, you don't fully understand what a certain word means. And this is actually posing as a huge challenge. 
So we'll see in the afternoon what we can do exactly about that. The other problem, which is a major one, is lack of qualified teachers to teach ICT. When this was introduced, there were very few teachers that were trained in the field of ICT. And uh, even though this has improved, but it is still a challenge because most teachers are not specialized in ICT. A search for many schools that I myself have actually interacted with, especially in the rural areas, you find that yes, a teacher is teaching ICT, but they're not trained in ICT. So it's purely based on their interest to want to teach that subject. So they do some research and see how best they can help the students. So this really is a challenge. Another challenge that uh, we looked at was to do with the controlled access to the computer laboratory. Yeah, the laboratory are there for uh, ICT studies to be conducted, but because computers are ex 